coming out tonight to the uh, Burger Republican uh, Column 1 Forum. Like a, welcome everybody here tonight. Um, we are going to have um, our candidates speak. Our moderator will be Jim Montano, who is the Vice Chair of Fairlawn Republican Club. I'm sorry, uh, Fairlawn uh, County Committee. And our hosts tonight are Fairlawn County Committee, Riverbridge County Committee, uh, Upper Saddle River County Committee, and Mawa County Committee. Um, at this time, I'd like to um, introduce our candidates. We've got Frank Pallotta running for Congress, CD5. We've got Linda Barba running for Joe Bouchard running for county commissioner. Our two uh, county commissioners are not here tonight. Um, they are home uh, sick right now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Jim Montana to uh, moderate. Without the mic. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, let me start by telling you what the format is going to be for tonight. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a three-minute sort of opening statement from each of the candidates and give them a chance to kind of generally talk about where they stand on um, their campaigns. Then from there, we're going to go to some moderator questions that will go directly to each of the candidates by myself. And during that process, we're going to have people available with cards for you to write your own questions in. Um, and what's going to happen is after I finish with my questions, we're going to take a five minute break to let the candidates get a drink of water, go to the bathroom. We'll compile those questions. We'll then go back on the program and I'll ask your questions to each of the candidates. Um, basically what my job in that five minutes is going to be is to call out the duplicate questions and things like that because I'm sure we all care about a lot of the same things and we have limited time. So we'll then go to, it's probably going to be one or two questions for each of the candidates from the floor. Uh, okay. So what I'd like to do is start with uh, the top of the ticket and uh, bring up Frank Pallotta to give a sort of three minute opening statement. Okay, we're, uh, we're doing a lot of these of late. Um, a couple of quick things. We are, uh, we are a slate of uh, five candidates. Four of them are running in the, ca in the county. Uh, I'm running across three different counties. Let me stay here. I'm running across three. Uh, running across three different counties: um, Bergen County, Sussex County, and uh, Passaic County. So while our issues are the same when it comes to legislating and leading, um, it's slightly different when it comes to what the problems and the issues are for Bergen County, which I know Linda, Mary Jo, and the team are keenly aware of, and what a federal candidate would be looking to do. Um, the thing that I think is important, that I think the team here believes is important as well, is relevant experience. We're in a tough time here in New Jersey. We're in a tough time in Bergen County. We're in a tough time in this state. Um, and what I think we need in this state is what we've been lacking for a long time in New Jersey, certainly from a congressional standpoint, and that is relevant experience for the times we have right now. We're facing some pretty tough economic situations and crises here in our country, in our state, and specifically in our district. Coming out of COVID, we know what poor leadership has done to the county. We know what poor leadership has done across Bergen County, and these two candidates will talk about that later. Um, in Bergen County and across the state, we lag in job growth. That's been the case for a number of years, but it hasn't been more obvious as it's been now. Um, we lag in growth. Our state is one of the last in terms of growth, and one of the reasons that's the case is we have the highest taxes, which we all know, which is something I know Mary Jo and the team will be able to address. Um, we're also in a position where we have companies leaving our state in droves for all the right reasons from a corporate standpoint. We have the worst corporate environment, they are leaving. We have the worst property taxes, people are leaving. The more people who leave, it becomes a death spiral. You're not attracting corporations. When you're not attracting corporations, you're not holding employees. When you don't hold employees and you can't give them jobs, they leave. And that's the problem we're facing now. That's why I'm going to Congress. I'm taking 28 years of private sector experience in the financial services, services industry, and I'm bringing that to bear with another 434 of my closest friends in Congress. It's about working together. There's too much of this, too much infighting going on. And I think having the ability, like I have, of 28 years in the private sector, where you almost didn't care about 
race and creed and color and party. You cared about nothing except what was in the best interest of your shareholders. In politics, your shareholders are the voters, and that's what matters. And when the voters look a candidate in the eye, when they look any one of the three of us in the eye, they're going to say, is this person going to be able to sell for me what I want done for me and my family? The answer you'll find out today is yes, and that's what I want to bring to the district. So thank you for your time. Next, I'd like to call up Linda Barber, who's running for county executive. So I guess I have to shout. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Linda Barba. I am running for county executive, and I would like to be your county executive. I have lived in Bergen County for 40-plus years, and I love my county. My friends say to me, I never met anyone that loves their county that you live in more than you. I love my town, I love my county. So what I want to do is I just want to bring my experience, and I want to work for every single person in Bergen County. I don't care what your party affiliation is. This is all about working together and getting our county back. We need our county back. We have 70 towns. We should be working collectively together so that every single town is, is bringing in businesses, bringing in residents, and that's what I'd like to do. And I just want to let everybody know that we need your help in order to get elected. And so we ask for your support, and we ask you to spread the word like wildfire. So. Thank you very much, and um, see you later. Uh, the next person we're going to call up is Mary Jo Ginchard, and she's running for... Thank you so much for having us, and thank you very much, Jim. My name is Mary Jo Ginchard, and I'm running for county commissioner, and I'm a resident of... Ridgewood, New Jersey, and Bergen County is our county. And I'm very excited about our team. We are column one, and the top of our ticket, as you know, is our candidate, which is, you know, Frank Pallotta, which is then Linda Barba as our county executive, and our other two commissioners who cannot be here tonight, which is Anjali Hakim and Paul Duggan. That is our team. We cannot forget column one. Why is that important? Because it takes a great team to make this county work. Why is that important? Because Bergen County needs all of us. The county has lost so much because of COVID as you know what Frank has talked about. Businesses have left, taxes have gone through the roof, gas prices have spiked Families can't afford to stay here. I was a mayor in New York. I've seen, you know, I've been on that side of the table where families have, you know, suffered. They've come to want to be heard. You, you, I, I'm sure y'all understand what's going on. Right now, when you hear government say, we're here to help you, run. Run. <laughs> Are they helping you? No. no. We work for you. We work for you. So this team is going to work for you. Because guess what? We are feeling <coughs> what you are feeling. So I promise you, the day we get elected, we are going to sharpen those pencils, and we are going to get things working. And that's what we're going to be talking about when these questions are going to be asked. We're going to explain to you what we're going to do, not how we're going to help you, but what we're going to do. That's the difference of this team. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the questions we're going to be asked. Okay, so the format I'm going to ask these questions is I'm going to bring them up, kind of one for each of them, so we break it up a little bit. Nobody gets bored with any one candidate. Okay. Um, so the first question, Frank, is going to be for you. Oh, sure. For me. Yeah. <laughs> you got to start off with it. Right. So come on up. Um, over the past year, inflation has risen to a 43-year high. Things like gas, food, used cars have seen prices skyrocket. If you can even find them with the shortages, mm -hmm. causing a, a huge debt in everyone's wallet and their finances. What can you do to stop inflation? What recommendations do you have uh, regarding the Fed 
with respect to the federal interest rates mm -hmm. and how that will affect the, uh, the individual voters? And how would you affect the uh, change in the supply line crisis, which is causing the shortages that we're finding, such as um, you know, milk, baby formula, sure, milk powder, sure. things like that? Um, and would you source that from abroad? Okay. Just you know, one question with 47 sub -parts. Fine, fine. I'll have to go back and take a look at some of the sub-questions. Um, uh, inflation is an issue. And I think what's made it a lot more obvious to people, uh, unlike what we saw in the 80s when Jimmy Carter was president, was we went from zero to 60. We went from sub 2%, probably one and a quarter percent inflation under Trump, um, with growth, and I'll talk about that in a minute, to a 43 year high in inflation. We're looking at sub 8%, just barely. Um, that's unsustainable. And it happened in such a short period of time because of a lack of leadership. So when you try to decide, you try and, and, and figure out how you go after inflation, um, how you attack inflation, how you lower it, you have to know what causes inflation. It's pretty simple. Gas is not the cause of inflation. Um, meat and groceries are not the cause of inflation. They're the effects of inflation. Inflation is simply caused by too many dollars chasing too few goods. That's it. That's been the case for the last 200 years. The too many dollars has come from poor policies where we see what the president has done. We saw what this congressional administration has done here in New Jersey. They signed off on trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in handouts and giveaways. That's the one side of the equation. The other side of the equation, as we know, jobs. We talked about it earlier. We're lacking jobs here in New Jersey. When you lack jobs, you don't have the ability to push forward some of those things. We know that, that the supply chain, chain crisis is about moving goods across this country. We can't find truckers. We can't find people working at the docks. Why? Because we still have policies in place that afford the, the, the worker a better option to sit home and stay home alone and to stay home and maybe get a under the table job where they're getting paid cash because they're getting paid more to stay home or the equal amount to stay home than they would to work. So what I would do as a congressman when that's the case, hate to say it, I'd make you guys who doesn't have a job, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to work. If you don't, and you do have the opportunity to work, but you choose not to, we have to go back to where we were just a year and a half ago, or two years ago. You have to show that you're looking for a job. When people are looking for a job, when they prove that they're looking for a job, then oddly enough, they find a job. Why is that the case? There's openings everywhere. People don't want to work at restaurants. People don't want to work as lifeguards, truckers. So that's why we have the problem with the supply chain. Not because the goods aren't there, we don't have the ability to move the goods from place to place because people don't want to work, they don't want to do the job. So what you have to do is create a series of incentives and disincentives in our economy to have people work. When people are working, guess what you don't have to give away anymore? Huge, huge taxes. You don't have to give away the money anymore. You don't have to give away the dollars that we saw in this administration. Now make no mistake, we did have to make sure coming out of the crisis that we made sure that our people, that our citizens, our residents were in the right place. But the government, at times, and there's only been three times in the last hundred years, as far as I know, where you needed the government, but you needed them as a crutch. You didn't need them to be your, your, your backbone for the rest of your career. And that's what we have now, and that's what we would stop. So I think we, you tackle inflation initially by making sure that you have fewer dollars and you have more people working so you have more goods out there. That's what creates it. The, the other thing that's important to note, and we talked about this earlier, is, and we're gonna get a little heady here, um, the measure called GDP, gross domestic product, that shows you how well you're doing. Now, as a country, we're clearly falling back, but in the state of New Jersey, we're falling back even further because our small businesses, and we can talk about this, don't have the ability, 19,000 small businesses are in my district. Half of them shut down during the pandemic. Not all of them have been able to open up, and the ones that have opened up are not quite yet at the point where they can start paying more money. The money that the government is saying is the minimum wage that is not supporting the business that they're doing. So there's a lot of things we need to do to get this thing rolling. The first thing is to put us on that, on that course. When it comes to fiscal or economic policy, when you talk about the Fed, um, and again, this gets heady as well, the, the Fed, I would say, in terms of, of how you... you, you you guide the economy is almost like a referee in a basketball game. You have to make sure that when you're looking at all the different factors that affect the economy, the Fed is creating money supply and policies that keep us in track, keep us right down the path. And what does that mean? You want inflation low, but you want growth high. Now, they, they work against each other from time to time because as you start to see the economy grow, inflation gets out of hand. 
let me know when anyone is bored, because this is an economics lesson that I went through for years. Um, so what you need to do, I like to say, is kind of make sure that, and, and by the way, the prior administration did this for four straight years. We had sub-2% inflation, and we had 4.5% GDP. It can be done. It can be done when you put people to work and you incentivize it. The monetary policy works hand-in-hand -hand with economic policy and with the White House and with Congress to make sure that the money supply that's out there is enough. You have to make sure that the job growth is enough that's out there. So you do that by, and I'm just going to bore the hell out of people, by making sure that you're playing the money supply game consistent with how we're growing. Is there anything else? I, know no, we're I'm pretty sure I can talk in another 10 minutes. Right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to hear <laughs> Jimmy, you're going to issue CE credits for this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next question is going to be for Linda. It has 75 so far. <laughs> and it's a one simple question. I'm not afraid. <laughs> All right, so the question for you is very much tied to Frank. So Frank just talked to everybody about what he's going to do on the national level. Your job is to run the county level. So a much more pointed question, and tying to what some of the opening statements were, is in the Java County Executive, you're going to be essentially the governor of Bergen County. As a governor of Bergen County, what are you going to do to help create jobs for the citizens of Bergen County? To get more money into their pockets to cover all these things that are higher expenses. Thank you, Jim. So first of all, what I'm going to do is, we all know that businesses are the lifeline of the county. So what are we going to do? We're going to work with our businesses. We're not going to chase them away. We're not going to have them leave the county. We want to encourage people to come into the county and open your business here we, because we are business friendly. I'm, I'm very tied to restaurants because of my column that I write and I know all about restaurants and businesses. During COVID, our restaurants suffered terribly. That would never ever happen with me at the helm for our county. It would never ever happen because I will push back on the liberal craziness I will tell Governor Murphy, no, Governor Murphy, not in our county. It's not going to happen. We need to stop, I think Frank mentioned it before, Nabisco, right around the corner. Do you know how many jobs? Do you know how many? So which meant that the residents now, a lot moved out of state, um, out of the county, I'm sorry. And so that was a major company. We all grew up with Nabisco. We knew when it was going to rain because you could smell the cookies. Mm -hmm. Now we don't know when it's going to rain. <laughs> so, so, I want to work with the businesses. If we have our businesses thrive, what's going to happen is they're going to hire people, hire people, hire people. We want people to come into our county. I, I go to grand openings all the time. I have never seen a county representative to say, hey, welcome to our county. Not one county representative has been there. I will be, if I cannot be, I will send a representative to say, listen, she has an open door policy, call her at any time because she wants you to stay, she wants you to be happy, and she wants all your employees to be happy. So, I, I, Mary Jo touched upon this before, we handpicked our team. We did not say to people, hey, throw your hat in the ring for commissioner, throw your hat in the ring for this. We handpicked our team. Our team, we all have a different level of expertise, but collectively, our hearts are with the county, and our minds will be with the county, and both will work together, and we'll get our county back. We have to bring Bergen County back. Um, and that's basically, I just want our businesses to thrive, and I want our county to thrive. Mary Jo, your question also has no subtitles. Oh. Right. So, <laughs> a lot of people get confused with your position. Okay. Are you a freeholder? Are you a commissioner? Like, you'll change the name, right? Right. So you're running for commission, which is sort of like the Congress underneath the governor that we talked about of Bergen County. So as a commissioner, what in your background prepares you or qualifies you for that position? Well, I'm going to tell you what I did um, in my past, which I will tell you the tools I will bring to the table, if that helps you. So I was first a trustee, which is like a council person. And then I became mayor, and then I was appointed as a um, member of the planning board of Orange County in New York. So when I became mayor, there was several projects that 
had been sitting on the table for many, for almost a decade. One was a dam, it hadn't been built for 10 years. I got that, the shovel in the ground in two years. Then we had a booth that was the opening of our village. It got mowed down by a driver. We immediately got that taken care of and you know that that got that got dealt with there was a historic building that needed to be renovated we got that taken care of what is the umbrella of what i'm talking about construction you can't let projects just sit there and not be dealt with <coughs> what does that mean those projects have to be bid out correctly what does that mean bidding in a government umbrella means projects have to be bid out not just by one bid but by several those projects you're paying for and they are done you know are, are all these projects with the you know your tax dollars are they going by the highest bidder are they being done by the lowest bidder do you even know if they're only by one person that is critical to know because that's prevailing wage. Prevailing wage means that there is a percentage put on top of that that is done because when you have a painting job done in your home, that's just a normal price that's being done. But in a government job, there is on top of that normal cost a percentage that's going to go to that union. That's just the way it is. Those projects have to be done by several bids, everything across the board. So do we know on all of those projects for everything on the, on the, on the budgets, are all of those projects being bid? So on all of that in our budgets for, you know, on um, that the, the, um, you mean the, overspending? the overspending that we're doing, is that being done? So that's what the commissioners need to be looking at. The county executive will maybe <coughs> divide all of that up between the commissioners. We need to be taking all of that budget, dividing it up, looking at it, and, and that's gonna be mainly one of our biggest jobs. I wanna make sure all of that is being addressed. Are we having nepotism? Linda has been taking countless hours looking at those budgets. I'm sure there has been some overspending. She has been addressing all of that. That is a big concern. When I was a mayor, we, uh, I definitely found a lot of overspending being done. You're paying for that overspending. So we can definitely find in the taxes of that right now. So, you know, I would definitely want to address all of that. Thank you. Back to me again. <laughs> I get to have more fun with you. <laughs> I get yeah, well, you got um, So when it comes to you, yeah. You're on the national level, but not just the national level, because in the U.S. Congress, you also deal with international matters. Yes. So right now, a big topic that is on everyone's mind is the war in the Ukraine and the <laughs> sanctions that have been placed. Uh, what is your position on whether the sanctions are working and what you would do differently, if anything, in that topic? Sure. In that let, me, let me answer the second question first. Um, what happened here, the situation we have, I believe, in Ukraine, is a combination of things that start with weak leadership and indecisiveness coming out of the White House. Um, we know on day one, when Biden got in the White House, he canceled the XL pipeline. And he did that for whatever reasons that he thought he had, but everybody knew everything he did was against what Trump or the prior administration did. Um, that set forth a domino effect that put the power in Putin's hands so that he could now be in a position where after 43 years of the United States being a net importer, they were finally a net exporter for about nine and a half months, and we became a net importer of oil again, which empowered China and empowered Russia. In my opinion, that's what set him down the path of what he wanted to do in Ukraine. Ukraine, as we all know, is, is, a, is a very rich country in what people like Putin and Russia needs to help them finance over the long term their movement toward where I think we all know where, where Putin wants to go. The next thing that happened was a terrible, terrible um, exit from Afghanistan. And I'll show you and I'll connect uh, where, where I think that goes in. That was a terrible exit. 
He had a path and he had a plan, a bipartisan path and a plan to get out of Afghanistan that he did not follow. We were a laughing stock of the world. Europe came out and said, we will not follow this president. Item number two, weak leadership. We now emboldened um, Putin by now being an import of, uh, an export of oil to us. And now Putin is thinking, well, gee, this president now doesn't have the backing of the European community because the European community just bashed this guy for terrible leadership. That, in my mind, is what started this move into Ukraine. So what would I have done? He never would have gotten it. Donald Trump was somebody who made it clear, and most Republican leadership makes it clear to third world dictators, to the dictators who want to do um, terrible things around the world, that you do it at your own risk, you do it at your own peril. That is not where this, Biden, the, this administration goes. And what I would do, and what I think most of our government leaders should do in Congress is stand up. We should stand up. And yes, there are executive orders, but if enough people in Congress stand up and talk about what the right thing to do is, that wouldn't happen. It didn't happen under Trump. So I don't suspect it would happen. So I, I want to go a step further. At this point, what would we do? The last thing any leader wants to do, I believe, is boots on the ground. The last thing they want to do is put our kids in harm's way. That's, that would be a last-ditch effort. So what I think I bring to the table, and most people who I think come from the private sector or come from the business world, like Donald Trump was able to bring to the table, is put us in a position where we are constantly negotiating. We negotiate from a position of power, from a position of strength, but you don't fail to negotiate. And that's what we don't have coming out of our administration. That's what we don't have in Congress right now. They all follow the leader. They stand up and they do what they think Biden wants them to do. You will not get them out of me, and in Bergen County, you will not get this out of them. We will stand up. My job is the people of the 5th District. I have a, you know, one, one foot in the 5th District, the other foot, obviously, in the United States of doing what the right thing is. But my job, first and foremost, is making sure what's doing all right for the, well, that I'm doing what's right for the 5th. So, you know, my position on Ukraine is this thing was coming down the pipe almost a year ago, Jenny. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to put boots on the ground. There's still the ability to negotiate. Are the sanctions working? To some degree, they are working. But we need more economic global sanctions. And Russia needs to know that these are not just short term. They need to know that what they did was the wrong thing to do. And it's not just current economic sanctions. They're longer term sanctions if we see them going down that road again. Again, I can talk forever on this, but I won't. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we're, seeing, we're seeing a rise in crime in Bergen County um, in recent years. What, as a county executive, would you do to address the rise in crime? First of all, um, I think that catch and release needs to go. Um, you know, they're all, all of this, I think our borders need to be closed. You want to come in? Come in legally. Okay. I'm all for it, and I'm, for, I'm all for helping people that want to come in, helping them get started with a job, a business, whatever. Come in legally. Um, close the borders, catch and release, done. Um, anybody that knows me knows I'm 110% pro-law enforcement. I think we need to teach everyone respect for our law enforcement again. Uh, I think we need to back our law enforcement again. They, don't, they do not get enough backing which is a shame. So how can they really do their job? Their hands are tied. We need to untie their hands. So our county has an influx, a, a terrible influx of crime, drugs coming in like crazy. Um, I live by the George Washington Bridge, so when I read the stories, it's scary what's trying to cross that bridge. Guns, we never heard of shootings and you know, women you know, getting raped for a daylight. We need to, what happened to when we were growing up? You do the crime, you do the time. We need to get back to that mentality, okay? The fact that we're, we're, uh, we're almost praising them for being criminals. I mean, and then, you know, you move to a suburb. I live in a city-like setting. I understand. It's transient. You move to a suburb. Why are you going to sleep at night and your car is being stolen out of your driveway? Why? Because they know it's like a revolving door. So um, another thing is, Mr. Tedesco uh, brought in, say, county prisoners. I do not agree with that. For on day one, I want to sit with the commissioners, and we're going to figure out how we can help the say county get their jail up and running. But keep your prisoners there, okay? We don't want, we don't, because what do you do? You let them out, you let them out into Bergen County. 
And I know this is not a funny subject, but I said, you know what? Why don't we get a bus, a tour bus, and just drive them around the county and show them the whole county. So it's um, keep your prisoners in Passaic County. We will take care of, of anyone that comes into Bergen County. And um, again, just, you know what? Let's, let's support our police. Let's support our residents, Let's our children. What happened? Why are we not protecting our children? Our children, that is our obligation. So I hope I answered everyone's question. <laughs> I don't think anybody disagrees with me on catch and release because I think it's a joke. It's a revolving door. So, um, so thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> So the next question is for Mary Jo, and it's going to be a little bit of a twofer. Okay. Um, so my first question to you, or first part of the question is, what would you do to put Bergen County in a better financial position, and what do you see as the major issues facing Bergen County at this point? I'll take the second one first. The biggest issue I see for Bergen County is financial. Um, it's taxes. You know, the taxes for everyone is, do you fill up your car, or let's even take it worse, do I put a half a tank of gas in my car and buy half of my groceries, and do I go to work with that? I mean, I, I'm hearing this from people I'm talking to. It's, it's a real issue. Even friends that I'm talking to, and, and when... When did we get there? And then their, their tax bills. Some of them are thinking about moving, and then when they move, they're still you know, faced with the gas bill and the grocery bills. And then there's the formulas of the mothers that are having their babies. And then I had one father say to me, my dad said he was raised on goat milk. And I, and I just kind of stepped back for a minute and went, where are you going to go get goat milk now? You know, I mean, are, are, where are we going with this? So, this is a whole different ball game that we're at right now. So, we're, we're at this financial issue, so then we're going to go to what Frank was talking about. Of we're, We've got to get people back to work. The incentives, the jobs back to Bergen County. The incentives back to people staying in Bergen County and people not moving out. So that's really going to be up to us to make everyone stay here and make it affordable to live back in Bergen County. We need to voice as parents in the school systems. I'm going to bring up parents' rights. We can't allow the schools to tell us how to raise our children. I think all of this, this is a huge issue, which I think on top of the taxes, this is a big Bergen problem. I have three older children. I think I did a fine job of raising my kids. I'm sure those of you who have children, you did a great job of raising your children. I don't need someone to tell me how the color of white is, the color of blue is, the color of yellow is, how to count one to 10 is, this has to stop. And if you as a parent do not stand up to your school system and tell them you disagree, then we're all gonna fail. And we have to collectively stand up and say something. And then we'll take control of our county because we are good people. We're Americans. We are Republicans. I'm an American. I'm a Republican. And I'm proud of that. And I love this county. I want to stay in this county. I want my children to stay in this county. And it's a problem if we don't. So that's why I decided to run. And I, I'm sure Linda agrees with this and Frank agrees with this. And that's how we're going to attack our taxes and staying here in our school system. Um, the first question you asked was... Uh, you just covered it. Okay. The financial side. The financial <laughs> side. So, you, did it, you did it all. Okay, that's it. So thank you so much. Now, don't get me started on all that because we'll talk forever on that. Okay. And you actually gave me a great segue okay. for Linda. Okay. Um, so Linda, 
big thing right now with boards of ed and things like that in every town across Bergen County is things like critical race theory and a lot of the curriculums and the parents being labeled as um, insightful if they complain to the boards of ed. What is your opinion on parental rights in being able to have a voice in the education of the children? Well, first of all, I served on the Board of Education in Fort Lee. I was, I was merely a child, and I did not have any children. And when they approached me, I said, you know, you want me to run for the Board of Education, but I don't have any children. And they said, well, that's good. And I said, you're right, because I don't have an agenda. So whatever I make a decision on will be for the betterment of the school and the children. So I believe, like I think every other person believes, your child, you're right to say how your, what your child learns and what your child doesn't learn. It, when we were growing up, remember the birds and the bees? We had the birds and the bees talk, but I think we were 16 when we had the birds and the bees talk. So this CRT and all of this has to stop. I think if they go back into the schools teaching the children respect, I think every parent would love that. Uh, if they go back in the school and teach every child social skills, with phones today, social skills has kind of gone, kind of gone by the wayside. So why don't you get back to education, which is what you're supposed to do, educate the children, and let the parents take care of the rest, uh, and let the parents have a say. Because I don't know any parent that if a teacher taught their child, I mean, we had it in Fort Lee, we had a drag queen come in and do story time to five-year-olds. You know what? It's great. I would love to go to the story time to hear the story time, but I'm an adult. A five-year-old should be going to story time and coloring and playing with their friends, mm -hmm. not, not listening to a story about a drag queen. So I hope I answered your question that I'm 110% for the parents raising their child mm -hmm. and the educators educating the children. Along these lines, what would you do on a national level to help support the individual states and counties that are trying to make a difference on this? Look, on a national level, um, it's no different than a municipal, a local, and what we saw in the gubernatorial races this year. Um, I think we, we've started to see parents wake up. we started to see voters wake up. Um, particularly when we saw two instances happen. First in Randolph, New Jersey, where we had a small group decide that they were going to remove holidays from the calendar and just call them days off. 30 days after a 9-0 vote to do that, there was a 1-8 reversal. Why? Because 2,000 parents basically came and made their voices heard. Seven months later, Terry McAuliffe running against uh, Youngkin in Virginia uttered the famous line, we need to take our parents out of the schools. The poll shifted immediately. A five or six point poll shift in just a few days. We started to see that come in New Jersey, but I think it was too a little too late. So I don't think there's any federal, I mean, certainly from a federal standpoint, there's not, there's not a lot you can do at the granular level from an education standpoint, but I think from a federal standpoint, you raise the awareness. You raise the awareness, as, as uh, both candidates mentioned here, the decisions have to be made by the parents, all of it. I'm a parental rights person, I'm a religious rights. Everything ends with the words rights. That's what I do, that I, I take an oath. Everybody takes an oath, but when you take an oath in Congress, um, you better believe it's all about making sure you adhere to the Constitution. And when it comes to rights, Jim, it almost doesn't matter what it's talking about. Parental rights transcends all the rights. So from a federal standpoint, what I want to do is I would just create a level of awareness, not just across New Jersey, but make sure that it goes across the entire country, that the responsibility for raising our children, for vaccinating our children, for teaching our children, for masking our children, belongs with us. It will always stay with us. So thank you. So I'm going to jump to Linda. What would you do to protect the integrity of elections in Bergen County? Oh, that was my question. <laughs> what would I do? Well, first of all, I think we need a better hold of uh, of the the early voting. I'm not a big proponent in early voting. I think for years we were fine getting to the polls, and our companies, if we were five minutes late because we had to go vote, it's our it's our right and it's our duty. So 
I think that um, getting getting rid of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we should go back to the vote by mails. I remember vote by mails. If you went away, you were entitled. If you were sick, you were entitled. If you're going to be home because you don't want to walk around the corner to go to the polling booth, is that really? Unless you cannot. If you cannot, obviously, the vote by mails were always that you know. If you were disabled, of course you got to vote by mail. And those are the those are the, the people that should be receiving them, um, or if you're going away or what have you. So I think we need to restructure and go back to you know it wasn't broken. Why did we need to fix it? So um, I think that, that that's what we should do. But I think that we should also we have a very antiquated system. So I think if we could find some money in the budget, and I'm sure there's plenty of money. Um, you know, the money that we received from the federal government for COVID, 1.4 million went to bonuses for the friends. And so we, we don't even know how much the federal government sent us. But I'm sure we could find money somewhere and upgrade the systems. The systems so there's accountability. Uh, the last election, we went down to the election hall when they were doing vote by mails. It was like... Um, it was like a comedic show. Uh, it was there was no sense of assemblance, nothing. And I said, well, this can't be good. So I think that you know, again, developing the systems, upgrading the systems. You know, let's let's join the new century. Let's not be antiquated because when when things are antiquated, there's no accountability. So I think that that is or is everything that I would like to contribute. And I'd also like to make certain that the per the people. <coughs> that are working in the election board. I think that people that are a municipal chair, a county committee, if you're, if you're a chairman of the BCRO, if you're, in a, if you're the president, you should not have a job, a county job. You pick, you either want that or you want that because it just leaves room for questions. So if you have a county job, keep your county job. If you want to stay in, in another position, municipal chair, or whatever, stick that, but you have to decide. You can't have it all. Because then I think it, it leaves questions, and I think we all have questions in our mind. I think everyone now is so skeptical. When I talk to people, oh, if I vote, you think it's really going to be counted? You think it's really going to count? And I said, you're obligated to do that. So, so that's what I would do, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, what would you do on the oh, national yeah. level yes. Frank, to address voter integrity on a larger scale? Sure. Um, 17 countries in Europe, plus Mexico, plus Canada, voter ID. Yeah. It's simple. It's yeah. simple. It's simple. It's simple. Yeah. It's simple. Yeah. 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 I think we all know why we don't push it here mm -hmm. in the United States. They claim voter suppression. I think the number is ridiculous. 78, 79 percent. <coughs> of all the people who are voting say they've got voter ID. They would use their ID if they could. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would do at the congressional level, I'd make it mandatory. Because the moment the left starts to say that it's voter suppression, I know a lot of people who have reached out to our campaign in the African American and the Hispanic communities that said, do they really think we don't have voter ID? Yeah. Do they really don't think we don't have the ability to have voter ID and go get a picture ID? So I think it's critical to make sure that we have voter ID. The other thing that I would make sure that we have and unfortunately, and Phil Murphy did this on purpose, but New Jersey was one of the few states that had mandatory vote by mail in the 2020 election. A lot of states had vote by mail. They expanded it, obviously, because of a health crisis. New Jersey made it mandatory. So what took Florida 10 years to do, which is vote by mail, which they do very well, they did it county by county, trial and error. What were the mistakes? What was missed? How did people get? How did the people notify? <clears throat> Again, it took them a decade to get it right. New Jersey, we had it shoved down our throats in one year. And what happened? It opened the door to at least how to identify, from a bad standpoint, where we can create fraud. And, and fortunately, in this election, there's not going to be a mandatory vote by mail, but we have to watch the drop boxes. We have to watch where the votes are gathered. If anyone saw 2,000 mules, you know what can be done. My view becomes, and this is a law enforcement, even though I'm not law enforcement, when you have a cop in front of a bank, it's likely that the bank won't get robbed. If you're running after the, 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 the perpetrator after it happened, it's already happened. The same thing happens with things like ballot harvesting and, 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 and shoving ballots into the, into, the, uh, into the drop boxes. 
We have to make sure that we're in a position, not only where, where we know and we have people there manned at the, at the, uh, at the drop boxes so that it's not happening, but we need people at the veteran facilities. We need people at the senior facilities. We need people at the high rises where they're gathering the ballots in the first place. Once they gather the ballots, that's step one. Then they have the ability to put it in the drop box, that's step number two. And if we find out that Mike Homicek, and we have him on video, and we know that he shoved a hundred envelopes, a hundred ballots into a drop box. That's true. <laughs> no, but seriously, if we have him on video, and we know it's him, and he put 50 ballots into a drop box, what are we going to do? If there's 4,000 ballots in that drop box, how do we know which ones that the 50 that he put in? We have no remedy. We have no way to chase. So my view will be, Certainly from a New Jersey standpoint, because while, while I think the, the voter integrity standpoint from voter ID, we can make that mandatory for us, but, but New Jersey has its own set of problems. And preventative policies is where I think we need to go. So I've worked at the state level to make sure that we're protected, but the national level, A number one voter ID. You get to take us home into the next step. Okay. So, um, Mary Jo? Kind of a closeout question. If these people here vote you in, yes. what's the first thing you're going to do for them? The first thing I want to do is definitely get the voter ID going. The first thing. Because we can't do anything if we don't have correct elections, if you don't get people voted in correctly. I am totally for voter ID. There's no reason why we don't clean up the list. There's dead people on the list. There's double people on the list. It, it makes absolutely, it is not anything wrong with voter ID. It makes no, no sense at all. So that's number one. Number two, you should not have an absentee ballot unless you absolutely need it. You know, if you're out of town, if you're disabled, if you're elderly, the way it used to be, that's what it should be used for. So it should go back to the way it was. So none of, none of the way they're just dropping ballots off to people the way it was during, that, that's just over. So that's the first thing. Um, if we can't be elected, we do you no good. We do no one any good whatsoever. So that's really it. Right. If you can't elect people correctly, So we're going to take about a five minute break. We're going to gather the questions that everybody did, give the candidates a chance to get something to drink, rest their voices, and then we'll swing back and start asking your questions. We're moving to your questions for the candidates. None of the candidates have any idea what any of these questions are. Uh -oh, you're looking so at me. this is far more, well, this is like that. Oh, I'll talk to you, Frank. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with Mary Jo, oh. just because she looks like she's in the middle of something. <laughs> so I'm going to make this easy on her. Right. Uh, Mary Jo, should yes, Bergen... I'm a loud talker. No. No. <laughs> should Bergen remain a sanctuary state? Oh. Ah, <laughs> my should gosh. Jersey remain a sanctuary state, especially in Bergen? So here's what I want to lead into that. So we were just talking about this, sort of. So here's what's going on, as you know, in Westchester, which takes us into New Jersey. If you've been watching the news, buses late at night are landing in Westchester. And as, well, not buses landing. Buses are landing, we've got a whole other problem. Um, planes are landing at night with Homeland Security on them with people, we'll just say people, and they're loading these people on unmarked buses, three buses, they're full of people from countries, and we'll say they're possibly illegals, right? And I have nothing against illegals, right? But you gotta come in correctly. You gotta come in through the process, right? My husband's Hispanic, he's from Mexico, born in America. His parents were from France and Mexico. They came in through the process. My great-grandparents were from Italy. They came in through the process. I'm all for that, but you got to come through the process. If I go to Newark Airport and I go in 
to the airport and I want to pick up a loved one and I stand at the airport too long, I am shooed away. I am shooed away and I just had knee replacement. And I do not want to walk a long way to go get someone. I cannot stay there too long or I will get arrested. But these three unmarked buses can drive on the tarmac to an airplane, get people, and then transport them somewhere to New Jersey. And where are they bringing them? <laughs> we don't know. No, this can't happen. So I'm sorry, Frank, we're going to call you. Uh, <laughs> we know we'll talk to you. We're going to call you because Governor Murphy's not going to do anything about this. Nope. And more votes. <laughs> Booker, right, is not going to do anything nope. about this. Spartacus. So. You know, and Linda and I are going to be helpless because no one's going to answer our phone calls because, unfortunately, we don't have anyone but our new congressman, Frank Pallotta. Yes. So, please, answer our phone calls. So, it's not going to be acceptable. So, does that answer your question? It answers their question. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, since you put Frank on the spot, I got to put Yeah, and, and no, no unmarked buses should be allowed at any airport at any given point in time so with Homeland Security on it. Period. All right. Frank, what can you do to stop Murphy administration and the DEP from decimating the construction and real estate industry with their draconian regulations? I want to follow up on something real quick before I get to that. Um, in Sussex County, I was part of the team that worked with Sheriff Strata to vote against the sanctuary state. We put a resolution together, we voted it down. That doesn't happen in Sussex County. All they wanted to do from a sanctuary state standpoint was cut down. So to answer your question, I've already done it and I will make sure that we do it in Bergen County as well. Woo! Thank you. So what's your uh, housing issues are we discussing here? <laughs> So what can you do to stop the Murphy administration and the DEP from decimating the construction and real estate industry with their regulations? Well, look, we, we, we have to make sure that, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about overbuilding and what's going on here, right? With, I didn't write the question. Okay. I just want to be more specific. Are we talking about affordable housing and some of the high-density housing that we're seeing in the area? Okay. I'll answer that, but that was my question. Okay, okay. good, good. Um, we have to find a balance between a growing state and why we move here, why we move to this state. Um, we all know affordable housing has nothing to do with affordability and nothing to do with housing. It's about lining the pockets of developers, it's about lining the pockets of lawyers. New Jersey is the only state where that happens. Oddly enough, New Jersey is the only state where a lot of crime happens, um, <laughs> both above and below the table. And, and that's a problem because we don't have, in my mind, enough people to stand up and say no. Why? Because up and down the political spectrum, up and down the legal spectrum, except you, up and down the legal spectrum, too many pockets are being lined by things like that. So what would I do? Look, when, when, when there's crime happening, and it's happening right under everyone's nose, and it's in New Jersey, and New Jersey isn't saying a word about it because too many people are benefiting, it is incumbent upon congressional leadership to open people's eyes and say, what is going on here? Like the Mount Laurel issues that we're talking about here only happens in New Jersey. It's almost like a quiet, don't say anything. The, the, what I think I would start to bring up, aside from it being criminal, is how can this Democrat administration talk about, well, you know, we've got to keep distancing and masks, and we've got to make sure we're not having people on top of each other. Yet they're building one floor on top of the next and the next. They're putting up housing wherever they can. I know this is going to happen at the, uh, at the Garden State Plaza. We're seeing a shutdown now of businesses where they're leaving. And what do you do if you're a landlord, if you're an owner, and you're looking at that kind of swath of property where you can put high-density housing in? Not even high-density. Any housing there. That's where, it's going to, that's where it's going to start to go. So I think you know what, what you do is we certainly need to work. Look, we just need a handful of people, particularly in District 5, where most of the problem is right now. And that's where you know Congressional District 5, a little bit of 11, and seven, hopefully we get Tom Kane Jr. in as well, where we have to be a lot more vocal about it. But we can't do it alone. We have to do it speaking with the Holly pieces of the world and our, uh, and our uh, assemblymen. We have to do it by talking with Kristen Corrado's of the world in District 40. Because it's starting to happen in areas where we didn't move here for high-density housing. 
you know, we're the most benevolent country the world has ever known. We understand the plight of people who need homes. We understand the plight of people who, who are struggling. Um, but the way the law is written now doesn't help them. It doesn't help to displace somebody from where they are to where they to, to bring them to, say, an Upper Saddle River. Um, so I think it's about, quite honestly, if somebody needs um, We need chutzpah in the, in the administration to be able to say, not here, not now. And that's what I would start to do here. On a more local level, uh, what do you plan, Linda, to do to fix the roads and the infrastructure? We're going to expand on this question a little bit in the bridges and roads and infrastructure in Burke County. Okay. So I'm going to use my friend's husband's term, uh, pothole, pothole Jim Tedesco. So we all know that our roads are awful, awful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the commissioners and I'm going to, first of all, we need to see whatever projects are on the table. We need to look at the projects that they have put on the table come November, November, November the day after we're elected, and we will see how we can prioritize these projects because the roads have to become a priority. They are no longer potholes, they're becoming craters. I stuck my foot, my leg into a pothole the other day and it was up to here. I mean, it was ridiculous. So, and we were just talking about it. When you're driving, you look like a kamikaze pilot because you're trying to dodge the, the potholes because they're not just potholes, they're actually bending the rims of cars. Yep. So we all work very, very hard for our money. Uh, we all, you know, like our cars, and why are we spending money frivolously? There's no need for it. Um, as far as the bridges are concerned, we again, we need to, I'm looking at the budgets, but we need to get much more. Besides that, I want to make certain that every employee that's in their county position now, I want to meet with every, first I want to meet with the supervisors, to say, I want to know the strengths and weaknesses of every employee in your division. Then I want to meet with the employees and say, hey, are you happy in your job, or do you think you'd excel in another department, another uh, division? Uh, I'm talking like a corporate person, sorry. But, you know, and if you're qualified for the position, that's another thing. We don't want to just hire our friends because they're our friends. I'm a businesswoman. I'm going to run this county like a business. I'm not, I'm not interested in the political machine. I don't believe in the political machine. I believe in running it like a business. And if you run it like a business, I think our experiences on a federal level, it worked. So let's bring it to our county. And um, I'm committed fixing the roads, fixing the bridges, fixing the infrastructure. With all the building that's going on, and I make a joke about this all the time, I'm concerned that Ang uh, Edgewater is going to detach and go sailing down the Hudson River with all of the building. So, And I say it's going to be like a ship going down the Hudson River. So. Um, and that's the only thing. I just want to make certain that we make it a priority that our infrastructure <coughs> is, uh, you know, the, the repairs that need to be done, our bridges. I mean, look at our poor communities that still have flooding. The guys in two term, you mean to tell me eight years later you couldn't find a solution and people are still dealing with this and businesses. Again, if businesses in the town know that it's a flood zone, they're not going to want to come in. Mm -hmm. And residents are going to move out. And residents don't want to come in. So, Let's just fix the problem. Again, let's make our county great. I, and day two, I'm going to meet with every single mayor, and I want to know everything that you feel and your residents feel can be improved in your town. Because, again, I don't care about party affiliation. I want to, I want to work with every single mayor. As far as we have many builders in our county, why do we need to go to another county? We have many builders. I believe in keeping everything in the county supporting our builders. If we need something done, let our builders in Bergen County, let them make money, okay? I'm not against any other county builders, but I want to support our people in our county in every way that we can. I hope I answered everyone's question. So this next question was put up for several different people, by several different people in the audience, and written several different ways. So I'm going to cull it down into what I hope is just kind of one question. <laughs> because it's your turn, you get to answer it. Oh, uh, So it, it could be either a Linda or a you question, but it's a county question. So what is your position on shared services between neighboring towns to save money? Oh, I love this. Okay, so I actually did this as mayor. 
um, in Tuxedo Park, we had shared services, and it's very important to have shared services because when you have an emergency um, in, in your village, um, we actually had an emergency when I was mayor in Tuxedo Park, um, and you are having to deal with something and you don't have enough of your officers or your DPW, you have an agreement with another department and you can bring them in and they will come in and assist you. When they have a problem, you will assist them. Let's say you don't have enough salt and mm -hmm. your roads you know, need more salt. You can borrow salt from them when they don't have enough salt and you have enough salt, they can borrow your salt. This goes across the board for all sorts of services, shared services. This is something that's extremely critical. Um, I don't know if this is part of, the county should have this, Bergen County should have this. The um, you know, villages here in Ridgewood should have it with you know, the adjoining services with Waldwick or whatever, whatever you touch close to you. You're obviously not going to pick someone that is five <coughs> communities away from you. Um, if there is a murder in your community, normally you will call your, um, you, know, you know, the FBI might come in. That's an automatic that happens. Um, your um, state troopers can be called in. There's all sorts of shared services that happen. That just, that's, those are contracts that have to occur. Some communities don't like to do it, which doesn't make any sense to me, but it is very beneficial to your budget. So you do not have a burden on your, on your budget. I hope that answers whoever asked that question. Frank Pilat. No idea. <laughs> Biden wants to cancel ten thousand dollars of student debt. What is your opinion? How about that? <laughs> I'm going back to school. That's a good idea. Um, I'm totally against it. Um, I'm totally against canceling student debt. Um, I'm not going to get deep into this, but my startup that I put together in 2009 was about creating a series of incentives provided by people who own debt to have people make their payments. And that included, st that included student loans, second mortgages, and first mortgages. Um, I did a lot of work around incentives and disincentives and, 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 and what they call um, behavioral theory around why people pay their mortgages and why people pay their loans and why people don't. You do not forgive debt. You create an incentive where maybe you can help them, whether it's a tax incentive, not just for the borrower, but you create the incentive in my mind when it comes to student debt. Let me take a step back. Student debt right now is crippling this country. It's crippling. And, you know, fortunately my son, both of my sons, they don't have student debt. But when they go out when they go out with their friends at night, they have to watch their friends nurse a beer for about four and a half hours. Because all their money goes to their student loan and goes to their rent. So it's a problem. They can't buy homes. They can't get a mortgage. So we need to do something. The system that created the level of student debt that we have was criminal. A lot of criminal stuff in New Jersey. It was criminal uh, on why that happened. So to answer the question right away, the answer is no. We 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 don't forgive student student debt, just for the obvious reason that you know Jimmy's kids you know got money from dad and someone else's dad had to work four jobs. Why should one benefit and not the other for the work that was done? What you have to do is create a series of incentives and opportunities for those students trying to get by who are crippled with student debt. My personal view: find a way to incentivize the employer. I don't know if it's after tax payments for the student to help reduce the debt. I don't know if it's a period of time that they work, that then a portion of their debt is reduced. But the, the, the incentives have to be aligned, and there's no alignment of, of, of interests when you just outright cancel student debt, even if it's a small portion. So the answer is no. So I know I'm not supposed to answer any questions, um, but I can tag on what you said, is when I graduated law school, one of the things that Republicans have done at the time is for lawyers who had significant student debt, they would forgive a certain portion of your student debt for public service. Exactly. Pro bono services for yep. people who can't afford yep. a lawyer, things of that nature. Well, I'm yeah. So there are exactly. there are a lot of ways to do what you're talking about. Yeah. That's right. Um, and on that note. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
uh, live band. Live band. Linda. Yeah. Yeah. What are the main differences between yourself and your opponent? No, it's not a thing. Be nice. Well, be, 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 be nice. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, please? Absolutely. What are the main differences between Linda and her opponent? Um, Thank you very much. Everything. Um, so I think we're going to start with my opponent. This is his seventh time running. I was on the Board of Education when I was a mere child. And uh, they loved me, actually, when I was there because I didn't have an agenda. So I was, I ran for, so let me go. So he, this is seventh time running. Um, I worked on, I helped the mayor's wellness program get started, which gave us grants in Franklin Lakes when I was there. I worked very hard with a great team of friends, and um, we helped in the last gubernatorial race. We worked for 10 months, tirelessly, in kind, and we raised a lot of money and a lot of awareness in Bergen County. So my opponent, um, I've, I've always worked in Bergen County, I've been in corporate, I've been in business, and I've worked um, as a realtor, and I've worked as an independent contractor. Independent contractors, you don't work, you don't get paid. You don't seal the deal, you don't get paid. So I'm accustomed to chasing the dollar, and that's what I want, that's the mentality I like people to have. Chase the dollar, because the more su successful you are, the more you make, right? You get, you get rewarded for it. So. Um, Todd's been in a government job for 16 years, 17 years, and he uh, now has a pension. So he, in, in a lot of people's opinions, that have approached me and said, why is he running again? I said, well, maybe he needs a job. I said, he just got a pension. He just retired from his government job. So when you work in a government job, there's no accountability. It's not like working in a corporate Half of these people in government, if they worked in a corporate structure, they'd be fired because of accountability. And obviously, you have to be very, very politically correct in a corporate setting. Uh, government, anything goes. There's no accountability. There's no uh, repercussions for if you don't do the right thing. So has he managed people? He worked for the Water Commission. That was his job. Uh, how's our water? Our water stinks. It still stinks. So he was freeholder twice. I've never heard him once say, as, when I was freeholder, I did this. So um, I don't know. What, what are his accomplishments? He doesn't even t tell you what his accomplishments are. So we do know that he worked in the government for 16 years. So the difference is, is that I'm a workaholic. Um, I don't really see in him, I don't see a drive, I don't see an energy level. And I don't see a passion. I have a passion. I have a passion for helping the Bergenites, everybody in Bergen County, businesses, res residents, just making our county friendly again. I just want to uh, say one thing where Mary Jo said before. Another thing that we could do within the towns, and I'm sorry, I wanted to bring this up, is we can get vendors for salt in whatever towns need, and we can all get together, and our pricing would probably be better on a local level and on a county level. So that's another thing I'd like to investigate and bring up. Uh, same thing as, uh, like I said, all the businesses that we have in Bergen County should be servicing the county and the towns. Let's keep our business and let's keep our let's keep our residents that have businesses. Let's keep them let's keep them thriving. So the difference is, is I think I'm more experienced. I, I want to run it like a business. Todd's going to run it like a like a political machine. And we have that now. So we don't need another political machine. We need new ideas, which is what I bring. We need um, a new mindset. And we need an um, awesome team. If I don't have a good team of commissioners, I'm going nowhere. We're going nowhere. So that's why it's very important to, uh, Mary Jo and I answered a question before. We both answered it the same way, which means we have like thinking. Paul, Angelique, we've all sat down. We all have the same thinking, which means it's going to be very easy to get the jobs done. We're not going to have to knock heads and fight with one another. So um, those are all the things that are important, and I just think that the, I just don't think he will have as great a team as I am, as I have, and I don't think that he has the experience to run and manage people. Okay. Frank, how would you address the southern border? Oh, 
We're not a strong country unless we have borders. Right. We have borders everywhere. Right. Um, the issue that we're having now with the left is they believe that borders are cage-like. It's not. This is not about keeping borders around our country, both the northern and southern borders, where we don't let anyone in. We talked about allowing the opportunity for people to come into the country. Um, my father was the first generation. Both of his sisters uh, were born in Italy, so he was born here. We get it. We understand it. The problem with, with people pouring off, there's multiple problems, people pouring over the borders, particularly the southern border, is we have two issues. And those two issues, I've done a lot of homework in Congressional District 5. It's about jobs, it's about drugs. In the suburban counties of New Jersey, we know the fentanyl is coming over the southern borders. We know that that's a terrible, terrible situation that has to be addressed. You could link it back to the border. You can link crime back to the border. You can, you can link a, a lot of bad things that are going on back to the border. If this was a mathematical equation, it would be simple. This is a political ploy that's going on with the left. That's what's happening. What we do have to understand, and this is something that I feel strongly about, is we need to increase legal immigration. We have to increase it, and let me, let me tell you why. In 1978, there were 2.3 children to every family that was born. That's relevant for the following reason. When people retire, the Social Security and the other benefits that are paid to them come from the people who are working today. It sounds like a pyramid scheme. It's kind of a bit of a pyramid scheme. You, take as, you have to take as many people to feed the people who are now retiring. Why is that an issue now? Because there's 1.6 children to every family now. The 2.3 that are retiring, it gets a little tough when you start to do the math. So how do you fix that? How do you solve for that? You somehow look to increase legal immigration. But you don't just increase legal immigration. In Canada, immigration is done the right way. People come in with sponsorship. People come in with a backing. People come in not necessarily with an education, but with the ability to do one important thing, add to the tax base today. That's how we move forward. If you're coming in and you've got some level of education and you're coming in to work, you're adding to the tax base today. What do we have coming into the southern border? They're a drain to the tax base. We give them housing, we give them health care, we give them protections. Um, that's the problem. They come into our country and they're an immediate drain on our tax base when we're already challenged. So we have to find a way, and guys, this isn't a tough equation. Increasing immigration is easy. People want to come to the greatest country the world has ever known. We have to make sure they do it. That I, I want them to assimilate, but if people don't come to this country and maintain who they are and, and, and try and figure out how they come into this country, maintain their, the integrity of where they came from, um, we're, we're going to be lost as a country. So to answer the question, we need to shut it down, we need to figure out how to open it up the right way, and then we have to figure out over the long term how to attract more people to this country who, would, who add to the tax base immediately. That's my answer. What's that? I'm not going to sit down. I've got one more question. All right. <laughs> what is your stance on the Gateway Tunnel project? And if you if you support the project, how would the eleven mil, eleven billion dollar price tag be paid? For? The Gateway Tunnel has been in the works and has been approved and has been ready to go for years. The problem with the Gateway Tunnel right now sits with jobs and revenue. We can't come to terms and. Honestly, this is a New York, New Jersey thing. I don't know all the details as to why, but it's, it's not a question of having the funding for it because it's there. It's a question of who's going to get the jobs, it's, it's already paid for, and then who gets the revenue stream as we go through. It's clear that, that we are a single, small, seismic event of shutting down New York. I was in New York City during September 11th when it happened. We were shut down, and that was something that came from above. Nothing happened with the bridges, nothing happened with the tunnels. If something happens with the bridges and tunnels, we are shut down for a long period of time. What we saw Josh Gottheimer doing today is talking about all the clawback money that he's getting, all the work he's doing, all the work he's providing to infra for infrastructure. That was $1.9 trillion of our money that's being spent. It was an infrastructure bill that was recently passed. 
when the infrastructure with the gateway tunnel bill is already on the books and it could already be taken care of. So in my mind, this is another tremendous failure of the Democrat administration, not just in New York, but in New Jersey, in being able to figure out how to sit down and come to the table with the right structure, the right revenue split, the right profit split. Again, Linda and, and Mary Jo talked about being in private sector and not really caring for the most part. Um, about party or anything else except what the right thing to do is. So the Gateway Tunnel, I, it, it's one of the first things I would do, I, and it's funny to say it, it's such low-hanging fruit because it's already done. It's just coming to terms and figuring out how, how the revenue splits work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move back to see if I was going to call one. Every question. <laughs> uh, Mary Jo, I'm going to throw this one back to you. Okay. Um, what are the main differences between you and the commissioners mm -hmm. on your slate and the opponents. I'm not going to talk about my opponents because I don't think they deserve airtime. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is us, if that's fair. Um, and a couple of things that I think is important that I give you food for thought, if that's fair. I want to touch upon back to the illegals coming in and the school issue. It's not as much of the illegals coming in that's worrying me. It's the age of who's coming in and that they're of childbearing age. And if we don't stop the education process today, that they will be teaching their children that they will be having and what they will be teaching them of a process and how they will be voting in the future. Just think about that and where they will be sitting this for our future. That's one thing. So just think about that. That's why it's so important we stop in the track, the school system today, because where are those legal children going to be 18 years from now when it's time for them to vote? Okay? When I was mayor, I was um, appointed by the DA to be with a group of mayors for the opioid crisis in New York. And to touch upon um, the issue of what's going on, I would love for um, Linda, as the county executive, to bring together all the mayors to be part of a commission to address the drug issue that's going on in the Bergen County, to group them together with the DA to address what's coming across in Bergen County for drugs. So I would love that. Too, and I'd be more than happy as a commissioner with all the commissioners to address that. I think that would be very proactive for us to do that. It's an issue we should address and to see how we could group that. And that way we could get all the mayors together to see what's important for the mayors and to meet monthly with the DA um, to address what's important for them. Um, and we could address several things. We could have about drugs. We could be talking about roads. Um, we could be, you know, when you addressed about um, salt. You actually bid about salt the year prior. That's really an issue because you don't know where salt prices are going to go. In Orange County, one year when I was mayor, there was an actual salt shortage. Um, Morton Salt is the big distributor for salt. And there was a salt shortage that year. Salt prices went through the roof. And um, that's a big budget item. So um, you have to address these things. And you have no idea what the winter storms are going to be like. So you don't know how to buy salt for your county roads. So these are things that we've got to figure out. And so we can actually help with all the mayors. And these are, I think, important things that, you know, for commissioners. That's how I want to help. I don't want to help the opponents. I want to help our commissioners do all of this with our mayors. So I think that would be a great idea. All right. That's what I would like to do. So this is the first time I've ever done this. Um, <laughs> but I have to thank each and every one thank of you, you because Bye. without meaning to, you've given the perfect transitions to every other questions that are coming up. Oh, I'm not going to um, have a question. Nope. nope. <laughs> um, so, for a closing so Mary Jo and Linda Barber both talked about salt <laughs> as in product that gets put on the road. Right. I'm now going to challenge Frank yes. on the salt <laughs> deduction, uh -huh. which has nothing to do with table salt or the salt <laughs> um, What is your position on the salt deduction, and what would you do to move that forward uh, in Congress? 
I'm sure. Well, we know the salt cap has affected no one in Brooklyn County. No one even knows about it. We're kidding. Um, it's devastating. It was devastating to Burton County. And what we, what we need to do is figure out, and, and let's take a step back real quick. Um, the two, the, Donald Trump's 2017 tax plan clearly is the one that, that put the salt cap forward. But what, what the plan also did was it raised the standard deduction from 12 to 24,000 and it affected the alternative minimum tax. What happened as a result? As a result, six out of 10 New Jerseyans had more money in their pocket at the end of the year. Now we have to keep that in mind because when Josh Gottheimer says, I'm going to eliminate salt, he's not smart enough to know that you can't just walk in and eliminate one part of it and still leave the others dangling out there. Why? Because the budget won't work. That's why Josh is not able to get this thing across. He likes to speak in, in these terms of, hey, I want to eliminate it, I want to, I want to eliminate the salt cap, because it sounds good in rooms like this. It sounds good when he gets out there. Then he points his fingers when it can't get done. The reason it can't get done is twofold. He doesn't know what solution. He doesn't know how to work the cap to a point where we either raise the cap or eliminate the cap, and you've got to play with the other triggers that affect the cap. So he doesn't, he doesn't have the economic sense and the economic know-how to put that together. The other thing, there's no incentive for the Democrat Party to eliminate the salt cap. Zero. That's why they haven't gotten it done. Period. What I think we should be looking at, and I'll get to the salt cap question, uh, my solution in a moment, is we need to figure out how to stop the accelerated race of ta rate of tax increase in New Jersey. The salt tax is not, the, the salt cap is not an issue if we didn't have ridiculously high property taxes. So that's not a job I can do as a congressman. That's a state job of property taxes. What I can do is I can't lower your property taxes. I can't lower your taxes. What I can do is lower your tax burden. That's what you do at the federal level. It's almost six of one, half a dozen of the other. So what I would look to do is a series of steps that, that lead to a, 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 an incentive for the homeowners, particularly in Burton County, where they're being devastated by this salt cap of $10,000. First thing I would suggest, and I've done a white paper on this, raise the cap from $10,000 to seventeen five as a step, as a first step. I think that's what we need to do. Raising it to seventeen five and lowering the standard deduction from twenty four to twenty thousand dollars gives you an, an effective cap on salt of twenty seven thousand dollars. So ten thousand is a cap hurts a lot of people. If you raise the effective cap to the mid twenties, it's not going to be tremendous for everybody, but it's going to help a lot of people. <coughs> Probably going to help eighty percent of the people that, that are under that salt cap or, or, or were affected by the salt cap of ten thousand. This comes down to a handful of things. Having a team around you with the economic know-how to sit down and talk about the series of solutions, not to really talk about party, but to talk about people. The people are suffering, the party's not suffering. So we need to sit down and figure out how we get the people with more money in their pocket, more comfort around what their kids are being taught, more comfort around what's going on with crime. But none of that happens if people are leaving because their taxes are too high. So I think it's a series of steps that eventually will lead to elimination of the salt cap. And that's what I So we've been going a while. What we're going to do now is go to a short closing statement for each of the candidates. I'm going to start the opposite of how I did on the beginning. I'm going to start from the bottom of the ticket and work our way up. So Mary Jo gets to go first. Well, first I want to thank you, Jim, for sure. you know, moderating. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Joe for, where are you, Joe? Ah, thank you so much for, you know, putting all this together, and for Jim, and everybody, and for Frank, and for Linda, and um, for our entire ticket, I want to, you know, say their names again, that who could not be here tonight, because it does take our entire team. So it's Paul Duggan, who is amazing, um, from Ireland. I'm so sorry for those of you who have not met him. Incredible, incredible individual. He um, is so wonderful. I cannot say enough about him. He will be an amazing, amazing commissioner and um, offers a lot to our ticket. Angelique Hakim, again, um, a small business owner, wonderful woman, also will add so much to our team. All of us have such different qualities to bring to our table. And of course, Linda, who you heard tonight, all of us are a little bit different, but yet so much alike. We all have different ways of saying things. If we don't agree on something, we are able to communicate 
and yet come to a solution and get there. And that's what you want. You don't want us all to be alive, right? You want us to be able to add something and get to the solution. That's what makes a, a great team. And that is who column one is. And it's so exciting to be column one. So just remember, when you vote, vote column one. Um, <laughs> vote column one. Um, we've touched upon so many things tonight. We've talked about CRT. We've talked about the border. We've talked about taxes. We've talked about immigration. I mean, there's so many things and so much passion about all of it. Um, I've been a mayor. Um, it, it's, it's so important, this election. I think this is one of the most important elections, at least in my time, that I've ever seen. If we don't get out the word to vote, this is a hit or miss election in my eyes. We either go one way or it's, it's not going to be pretty, I, I, I believe. I want to leave a place for my grandson to be proud of. This country is at a turning point, I do believe. I remember, I, I have a father-in-law that I adore, and he just passed not too long ago. And I remember an election not too long ago that um, when it was happening, he said, if this president gets elected, our country is go going to go down a path that's not going to be pretty. And I moved to this country for freedom. And you don't understand what's going to happen if you don't have this freedom. We're heading down a path that our freedom is at stake. And it's up to us to hold on to this freedom. Freedom is in our hands. Don't let this freedom slip away from us. So all of us, we, we, it's, it's us. We are the ambassadors for this freedom. We are the ambassadors. So tonight, make one phone call. If you make a phone call, that phone call is going to make a phone call, and then that person. June 7th is the day. June 7th is the day. Take us to that election. Take us there. I'm going to vote. You're going to vote and get another person to vote, and we'll spider out, and we'll get there. Thank you so much. So I think by now you know that I have a lot of passion, <laughs> and I'm very passionate about our county. So I, I assure you that if you do put your faith in me and column one, we will not disappoint you. We will work very hard for you, we will fight for you, and we will get the job done. I just want to, I just want to touch upon column one. Column one has honesty, integrity. We want to, we want to be fiscally responsible for Bergen County, which is not what goes on now. It's mayhem. But, um, and we also would like safety. Safety is a big issue in our county. We don't, we no longer want the drugs to come through the county. We want to, we want to get our county back to being safe. Again, I live in Fort Lee. There's no secret there. I know it's a transient area. I was never afraid to walk in my town. Now I walk and I look all around me and um, it, it's scary. So like Mary Jo said, we're at, we're at a crossroad, but it's not a good crossroads. It's, we're going down a bad path. And we need to redirect and get our county back. We have Frank that's going to help get our, on a federal level, get, get it back. But we're, go, we're going to work on our county because our county needs a lot of work. But I just want to repeat, integrity is something that is lacking. And we need to bring it back into our county and into our government. So, and I can assure you that column one, a lot of integrity, a lot of honesty. So, and we're business people. We're not, we're not a political machine. So, I thank you all tonight for being here. I thank you for listening to us. Um, and I really hope that if each and every one could go out and tell your friends, um, we can win this. And if we win it June 7th, 
we're off to the races and November is just a couple of months away. And I assure you, it'll be the best decision you ever made. You can assure your friends that, and your family, and even your enemies. So I thank you all very much again, and um, I look forward to, uh, to being your county executive. I'm not going to be used to this, but you get the last word. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I promise you, I will just talk and talk and talk when I get to Congress. The filibuster knows no enemy in me. Um, um, look, I think in addition to integrity, and, and both of these ladies talked about it, and we both are we are both living through right now um, what this organization is doing to this slate, what they've done to this county. We have not won a county race in Bergen in eight years. We are 0 for 26. That's a problem. That's a problem with leadership. It's a problem with integrity. It's a problem with raising money. There's a lot of problems we have. Rooms like this, hopefully more filled in the future, um, it's where it starts. It's where we start. My personal view here, when it comes to any legislative position, any leadership position, in my opinion, it's about experience, relevant experience. The Republican Party is not about identity politics. We have two great three, one of them is not here, three great women. But we're not running on them being women. We're not running on Italian women. We're running on the best, most experienced people to do the job. We talked, Mary Jo, earlier about handpicking our slave. Was it Mary Jo? Handpicking our slave? Um, yeah. That's true. We went and we looked at what's wrong in this district, what's wrong in this state, what's wrong in, 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 in this country. And we tried to put a group of people together that had business experience, small business experience, practical economic experience. Why? Those are the problems we have today. And we need to address those. So when people say, well, you know, experience doesn't matter, I'll tell you what doesn't matter. Josh Gottheimer has three years of private sector experience. The other two candidates, uh, the other two um, uh, Democrat congressmen, um, Mikey Sherrill and Andy Kim combined have five years experience. We're in the position we are in this state because our three congressional leaders have combined experience of three years, of eight years. That's a problem. We need to look to our leaders and the way our founders wrote the, the Constitution. The reason they wrote Congress the way it did was people had to work in their district and down in Washington. Why? We wanted the people in our district to understand what the plights and, and, and what the, the struggles were of the people in that district. So I think I'm that person. I've spent 30 years in Bergen County. I've spent 28 years in the private sector. No one in this room, none of the three people running, need this job. We're doing this because we want to. We're doing this for you. We're not just doing it for our families. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. So I think when you look, when you make your decision on June 7th, I think you really need to take a good, hard look at who really has the experience I need. What's the problems that we have in this district, in this county? Who is uncorruptible? Who has the relevant experience to basically address the situation, uh, address the issues that, that keep us up at night? And I think we have that with column one. I certainly know that I have it, and I won Sussex County's uh, line, and I won the Passaic County line, because they looked at what the different candidates brought to the table, and they said, I like that guy's experience. That's not what happens in Bergen County. In Bergen County, I think we all know from some of the things that we've read recently, it's party leaders deciding they want to put up the person they want for the reasons they want, lining their pockets how they see fit. And I didn't really want to go down the road and talk about this. We are an uncorruptible slate. We're an uncorruptible mm -hmm. organization. Fair law and so, I promise you, this slate and everyone who will follow us will see the example from this slate. And I don't take it a little too long, and I apologize. <laughs> 20 more minutes, I'll be out of here. But what you're going to get from us is exactly what you dreamed of in a legislator, is somebody who knows that we work for you. We will always work for you. So thank you very much for your time. Thing. And I wasn't going to say anything about the opponent, I'm not going to say his name, but if an opponent says to you they're not going to take a salary, run. This is why. Where I was mayor, we didn't take a salary because we didn't have it on our budget item. But you want your, your elected official to always take a salary. Why? Because you want to hold them accountable. You want to hold them accountable because that's your tax dollar. You want them to work because if they're not working for you, you want to say, I am paying you 
you owe me to work. This is a $750 million budget. They're getting paid $30,000. If they want to donate their salary, they can donate their own money to somewhere. They should be getting paid and going to work every day or every whenever they're supposed to be working and earning that seat and working for that seat. So just because they say they don't want, you know, they're going to donate that money, no. Don't let that fool you. Mm -hmm. I just think that's really not the answer. That's all I have to say. And Frank, don't worry, you don't really get the last word I knew. Sorry. I get the last word. I get the last word. I don't get the last word either. So I get the last word. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I think this was an amazing group of, like, I got to say, the questions that were handed up were awesome. They were all on point. Um, so thank you, everybody, for taking the time out today. I know it was a hot day. It was, you know, right after the holiday. But thank you all for coming. The candidates are going to hang around for a little while longer. Um, anyone has any follow-up questions, absolutely feel free to ask them, and um, they will be here. Questions?